What's up YouTubers and plant lovers? It's Justin and today I wanted to show you how I'm going to transplant and care for my Ginkgo Biloba Bonsai. Now the scientific name for Ginkgo Biloba is Ginkgo Biloba. Uh, and in Japanese, ginkgo means silver apricot, and biloba means two lobes. Uh, so that's where it gets its name, and I believe the common name is the maidenhair tree. Uh, and that is because its leaves kind of resemble a maidenhair fern. Uh, so that's where the common name comes into place. Uh, now... Before I go into great detail about this, I want to excuse myself. I'm feeling a little under the weather. My nose is really congested. Um, I've been coughing a lot, so I know that I'll be sniffing a lot, and it'll be a little bit hard for me to breathe, so just bear with me. Uh, but if you do know anything about the ginkgo biloba, it is renowned the world over. Uh, in the fall, it's got beautiful, pristine yellow foliage. Um, the males are a little bit more sought after than the females only because the females produce a fruit or a nut and in the towards the end of fall the beginning of winter uh, the females will drop the fruit and they will begin to rot and emit a smell that kind of smells similar to vomit uh, so a lot of reputable dealers uh, and nurseries won't sell a female for that reason mostly you'll end up getting a male uh, but you won't have to worry about putting up with that kind of rancid smell uh, just before winter time hits I believe they drop theirs around no late November early to mid December uh, and in some places uh, the snow and the ground is already starting to fall the snow is already starting to fall and the ground is already starting to freeze over but if you do have them down south you will smell uh, that rancid smell that a lot of people do not like that really indicate that winter is on its way uh, but they are great trees to have. This is called a living fossil. Uh, there is no other member of the ginkgo family. Uh, just the ginkgo biloba is the only one. There are different kind of hybrids out there. Uh, this is a hybrid of one. Uh, it's mainly kind of kept small, uh, so it won't get as large as a, like a huge ginkgo tree. Uh, but this guy will kind of stay a little bit smaller and is perfect for the bonsai specimen. Uh, but like I said, they are called the living fossil because they coexisted with the dinosaurs a long time ago. And in fact, they are, have found uh, fossils that indicate that these trees have been around for around 270 million years. So this is the oldest living tree species on the planet. Uh, I mean, there is one tree that is in China that is around 3,500 years old, still kicking. Uh, but, like I said, these trees have been around forever. Uh, so they are called a living fossil, and uh, they've basically remained untouched for millions of years, and have been greatly successful at what they do. And I know that back in the day, they seemed to believe that the reason why the fruit smelt so bad uh, was kind of a way for the seeds and everything to kind of get uh, carried away and dispersed. Uh, some winds can kind of carry seeds up to a mile, maybe a little bit further, but birds and animals that eat it can carry it even further to actually kind of spread their rain and uh, make sure that the tree goes further north or further south or wherever it needs to go and wants to go really. Uh, nowadays, they have reason to believe that maybe, you know, some dogs will eat the seeds because they're attracted to the smell of the vomit. Uh, but if you'll notice after they eat it, they end up kind of feeling sick. Uh, and that is because the seeds are a little toxic. Um, I know a lot of people around the world actually collect them, uh, but they can make some people sick. Um, but there is a lot to kind of be thought at with this because uh, a lot of the leaves and a lot of the seeds and stuff and a whole different parts of the tree are actually being used for medicinal purposes in the world. But you got to be careful with that because a small percentage of the population actually ends up having trouble and getting severely sick from that. Uh, but there is great indication that it helps with blood flow and memory with Alzheimer's and uh, even erectile dysfunction. Uh, so the tree actually does do a lot of help more uh, better than the harm that it actually does create in the small percentage of the population. Uh, but you do have to be careful and make sure you know what you're doing uh, whenever you go to ingest any part of any kind of plant uh, out there because you could end up getting really sick or even just being full of thinking that you have what you have when actually it's something completely different. 
so I wouldn't go around and just gonna go ahead and pop seeds in my mouth or nuts or anything like that. Uh, so just be very careful of all that. Now, as I was saying, um, these trees are very uh, resistant to fungi and disease and pests. I think as far as pests, they have a couple of little different caterpillars that may bother them, uh, but they're really resilient to fungi. Uh, so they don't really have a whole lot of ailments out there in the natural world that will cause them problems. Uh, unlike most trees, most deciduous trees can't even put up with pollution, uh, but the ginkgo biloba is actually a great street tree uh, for large cities just because they're able to put up with a lot of poisonous kind of salts that end up into the uh, soil around the tree. Uh, and what would kill most trees, the ginkgo biloba ends up thriving in that situation, especially where there are a lot of streets and a lot of cars putting off a lot of pollution. The ginkgo biloba is planted on those trees and it does just fine there. Um, it can tolerate all kinds of soil uh, from acidity to alkaline. Uh, to kind of sandy soils, to kind of clay soils, and it can even tolerate cold temperatures. Uh, the tree is native to around Southeast Asia, more specifically around China, uh, and a lot of people harvest the tree out there. Uh, but, uh, like I said, it's just a great trade to have just because it can put up with all that that normally another tree probably wouldn't be able to at least thrive in those conditions. The ginkgo biloba does just fine. Uh, so as I was saying, I've talked a lot about the tree and how great it is, uh, but today I'm going to go ahead and repot this guy. I've had him in this container for a little over a year now, and you can see a lot of the roots are coming out on top. I keep trying to cover it up with soil, uh, but this container is not really that thick and that deep uh, or even that wide. So again... If you've watched any of my more recent videos, you know how I felt about bonsai pots and the mica pot. Uh, so I have him in this kind of clay pot right here, um, and it's very kind of strong, so it constricts the roots a little bit, and it's not really that deep or wide to actually give the plant room to kind of spread out. So you can tell that a lot of the roots on top are just kind of trying to go along the uh, surface of the soil and just to kind of give themselves a little bit more room. So I've noticed it is time to go ahead and repot him and kind of prune him up and make sure that I give him a little bit more room. Uh, so I wanted to show you how I'm going to do that today. So now we've got our, I think this was a mica 9 inch. It ends up being about almost 10 or 11 inches on the inside. Uh, and it's rather deep too. And of course, as you know, the mica pots are great pots to have. They are really, really, really cheap. I believe this guy was around $17. Uh, and they kind of have that show look for a bonsai pot uh, that's kind of just simple and easy and kind of uh, elegant, elegant, elegant to look at, eloquent to look at. And they uh, look really kind of sophisticated because they don't have too much going on. Uh, so that kind of minimalistic approach. Uh, and they do have adequate drainage holes on the bottom right here. So uh, the first thing we need to do is go ahead and cover those uh, drainage holes up. So I will go ahead and get my little grates to kind of cover up the bottom of the drainage holes so that water will be able to kind of leak through the bottom. Uh, but it will hold a lot of the substrate in place too. Now, uh, you always want to start out by sanitizing on any, uh, in, any and all of your tools that you are going to use. I have my root hook here, my root rake, my pruning shears, and another set of pruning shears here too that I will go ahead and sanitize before I start uh, any work with the plant. As you know, if you don't and you start using these on another plant, you can in fact actually start spreading diseases between plants if you don't sanitize adequately. Now, as always, I sanitize with warm soap and water or uh, isopropyl alcohol. All right, and now after sanitizing all my tools with some rubbing alcohol, I will go ahead and insert these little grates down at the bottom over the drainage hose so that we don't lose a whole bunch of uh, sediment and our soil will remain in the pot. Now all you do is uh, kind of feed your wire through some of the holes, just two of the holes, trying to keep it as straight as you can. And now we've got it through. It looks just like a V or a U straight through there. And then we'll feed the two ends down through the hole and lay the grate over top of it, turn it upside down while keeping it centered. Bend one leg down one direction and the other down in that direction. 
and then make sure you kind of push the bend of the grate up a little bit so that it anchors it down in there and then we'll clip off any of this lengthy part of the wire that uh, is kind of showing on the end of the pot that way it'll have a little bit of a lip to hang on and hold on to the pot but it won't be kind of sticking out from underneath it to look rather unsightly so I would say leave about two inches that uh, the wire can kind of grab onto the pot and then anything longer than that just kind of cut it off and you may have to go back over and give it a little bit of pressure to make sure it's kind of holding on to it and it's not bending out and that's the easy way to do it uh, there are different ways out there that kind of uh, make sure that it's a little bit more secure but uh, I'm not getting too fancy with mine we'll grab another one and then do the same thing on the other side so I'll feed it through two areas or two holes in the grate and then just kind of feed it up through there now it does kind of help if you leave a little bit more space kind of through the grate uh, actually I just have to see all right so now we've got our grate secured in there uh, water will be able to drain out and it will hold all the sediment in place and not end up losing a bunch of soil through there next I have my little white container underneath the table so that I can begin to take the tree out of the pot <laughs> and then this container down below will actually catch it and next I need to loosen the wires underneath from where I twisted this in last year so be patient because this will probably take a little while the only thing I'm doing is holding the uh, tree in with my right hand and kind of feeding the wire out with my left and kind of just keeping them centered and gently kind of pulling this wire through there and be careful because you can damage the roots and consequently the plant too so just take your time and don't rip it out of there this wire is too long I'm just gonna go ahead and cut that off there there we go That'll make it a lot easier all right next I will tip him sideways and kind of actually no what I'm going to do next is leave him in there and then I will go ahead and put some soil into the container and make sure the container is ready to receive the plant as I said earlier these trees are great in any kind of soil condition uh, they like re really kind of rich uh, porous soil something that will have a lot of nutrients in there for the tree uh, and also uh, drain really quickly with the water so uh, to make sure that it drains really quickly at the bottom, I'm just going to fill that up with a whole bunch of cactus oil. So nothing really kind of obstructs the water as it drains out. It'll be able to run freely instead of holding it down in there. And actually keeping the tree a little sick. Uh, because they do not like to stand in saturated soil all day. So I make sure that uh, it's quick draining now I will tamp down the soil a little bit that way when the roots kind of go in uh, they aren't surrounded by a whole bunch of air bubbles you don't want to press really hard you don't want to compact the soil completely uh, you just want to tamp it down some uh, if you end up really compacting the soil the roots won't have a whole lot of room to kind of spread out uh, and it will actually kind of bundle the roots up and uh, they won't be able to spread out, uh, so they won't be able to gather a whole lot of nutrients or water either. So uh, don't do it too hard, but do compact it some. Now, I don't want to just pull him out of here because he's in that pot pretty good with his roots and everything. So I will kind of tip him over and then kind of knock some of the substrate out with my thumb. Now it rained two days ago, so I didn't think I would have to actually go ahead and water him again. Uh, but his soil is pretty dry. 
So I'm gonna enlist the root, the help of my root hook to kind of get down in there and displace some of that soil for me. Now be careful because there are roots in the bottom and you don't wanna rip all of them up, but you wanna kind of displace some of the soil in a way that you won't be able to with your finger. So just kind of work your way around the sides of the pot, just kind of loosen it up some. And if you come across a root, you'll notice because it won't move as easily, don't rip it up through there. Just kind of go lightly. All right. So now I will remove a little bit of this substrate uh, with my fingers and kind of tilt him over a little bit and see if gravity will kind of take over. And some of the soil is falling out, but you can tell he's in there really good with the roots. So I don't want to rip him out of the pot. Actually, there we go. Awesome. Now you can tell, look at all this root mass right here. Uh, he needs room to actually kind of spread out some. So what I will do now is kind of use my root rake to get in there to actually separate the roots with uh, minimal damage. Uh, and this root hook and root rake actually do that quite well. So as you can see, I can sift through the soil and all this and get it out and leave uh, most of the roots potentially unharmed. Now, of course, you do want to separate the roots relatively well. That'll give them room to kind of spread out and kind of grow. Uh, if the roots are kind of constricted, uh, they're not gaining as much uh, nutrients and water as they need, and consequently your plant won't put on uh, the right amount of mass. And uh, if it doesn't choke your plant out and kill it because it can't spread out and grab the right amount of nutrients and water, uh, it will choke it up and probably kill your plant. And if that doesn't happen, your growth will be stunted. So you definitely do want to kind of work in with the roots a little bit and kind of separate them as best as possible. And this root rake really does help tremendously. If I were to do this with my fingers, I would rip a lot of that up and it would take at least twice as long. And you can apply some pressure, uh, but you don't want to rip through it all. You just want to kind of loosen the soil up and get through the roots. Uh, if you notice that it starts to get uh, rather hard to run your root rake through, uh, switch back to your root hook and that'll actually help separate a lot of uh, the soil that's down deep in between the roots uh, that you're kind of scared to actually run your rake through. Uh, but if not, you know, you can just go ahead and use the rake. It really won't hurt too much, but it may be a little easier, especially around the larger roots to kind of get the hook in there and kind of displace a lot of that soil down in there. And as you get a majority of it out of the way, uh, it becomes a little bit easier to use your fingers to kind of gently sift through all this. I'm probably going to have to use my hook again for just a little bit and my rake on the bottom because these smaller roots don't want to let go of what they've got. All right, now, last year when I got this tree, uh, the root mass was about a quarter of this size and as you can see now it's just insane and it's large kind of voluptuous kind of thick roots um, so this is why we go ahead and we prune back the roots some because if I were to stick this down in the pot it really wouldn't be but just a couple of months until it pretty much filled up the whole pot and as you can see I've got a little weed right here so I'm gonna go ahead and remove that but uh, he is tucked down in there with the roots of the tree so removing him isn't the easiest that's why the hook and rake will come in handy again and I can get underneath his roots and just kind of pull him out of there just like that because if you leave some roots behind you may end up with another plant coming up just as soon as you repot it now as a general rule of thumb for most plants, you can remove about three quarters of a plant's root mass without causing the, causing the plant harm. Uh, with trees, it's a little bit different. I'm gonna remove probably closer to about 50% of this. Anything that's over about two inches, I'm gonna just go ahead and try, try to uh, trim back. And this is the uh, secret to bonsai, because if you just prune above the soil and not below it, like I said, you will kill your plant. Or choke it out uh, so in order to keep it small you want to trim the roots and you want to prune the top part of the plant as well 
All right, now we're kind of in a little circular, little ball shape. And when he's in the center of the pot, hopefully that'll give him ample room on all sides to kind of spread out in the hunt for water and nutrients. And it's probably a little bit more than about 50%, uh, but I'm not really cutting into the really big ones unless you have a really thick one kind of at the bottom that may impede it from actually sitting down flat. Uh, you could remove those, uh, but for the most part, I'm just removing kind of the smaller ones. Uh, there is some thickness to the ends of it, uh, but some of them in the middle are kind of thick too. Uh, that's at your discretion. I think this would be okay for him. I will just kind of trim it up just a little bit on this side and just a pinch on this side. All right. Next, what I'll do is I will go ahead and make a little divot in the center right there to kind of give the roots a little spot to sit in. Next, you can see I've got a little problem with some gin. This dead wood right here, uh, it's not dead all the way because the leaves are sprouting off of it, uh, but you can tell the tip is really withered. Uh, it doesn't look like it's gotten much uh, water and it's starting to uh, look unsightly. So I will take my pruning shears, and I've got one over here too, and kind of just prune it back right there. Uh, these are more for uh, cutting off branches that are at the base of the uh, trunk. That way uh, when you cut it off you don't leave a little nub that looks unsightly and will end up dying and uh, take away from the aesthetic of the tree. It actually flushes with the tree and removes it right flush with the tree so you actually uh, it will heal better and look a little bit more normal and realistic of a tree in nature. Next I've got my bonsai soil here. It is rather tricky to open, but it's Hoffman's. This stuff is a really good bonsai soil. I will incorporate some kind of down here around the roots a little bit to add a little bit of heft to kind of hold the tree upright. And I'll mix in a little bit more cacti soil and then some more bonsai soil on the top there. Now I do want to talk a little bit more about care with these guys uh, and as you add soil in make sure you do kind of compact it just a little bit. Uh, you do this to remove any air bubbles that are being trapped when you pour the sediment in uh, and if you leave a whole lot of air bubbles around there uh, it will wreak havoc on the roots and then end up killing your plant if not caught in time. Uh, so make sure you're not pressing hard enough to uh, snap the roots or break them but you do want to apply steady even pressure kind of all the way around and then once you're done planting the tree you want to water it to remove any other air bubbles that tamping may have missed but as for general care with the ginkgo biloba's like I said they are pretty easy plants to take care of they're not fussy when it comes to uh, soil they're not fussy when it comes to a whole lot of light uh, though they do prefer full sun but you can keep them in some partial shade not a lot uh, but they do their best work and look the best uh, in a full sun area water uh, they're just about any other tree when it comes to water they do like a good amount of water they don't need a whole bunch of it older more established trees can go a little bit longer in between areas of water uh, but they do like a little humidity as well too so water is very important to a ginkgo biloba but it's not something that you would need kind of like a fern or an orchid or anything like that uh, like I said pest nothing really bothers a ginkgo biloba tree uh, they do have a little bit in the way of some viruses and maybe uh, a couple of pests but really all I've seen is mostly kind of uh, caterpillars and a lot of those are regular size ones that you could walk up to a tree and just kind of pick it off. Like I said with soil they prefer a quick draining soil um, they like a little bit on the acidic side but they can do alkaline as well uh, that's what makes these trees very popular uh, and they can put up with a lot of abuse uh, they don't need a whole lot in the way of clean air they can tolerate pollutions really 
really well. So that's why they are really popular in larger cities from like New York all the way up to Seoul, Hong Kong. A lot of these places use the ginkgo biloba tree just because they can put up with a lot of abuse that comes with living in a city just from all that uh, pollution. Now, on the rest, I will go ahead and just add in this bonsai soil because it is a little bit heavier. So it will actually hold him in place better than if I just were to use a sandy cactus soil like I'm using. All right, now, I've tamped him down some to kind of compact it to get rid of some of these air bubbles. But like I said, you don't want to press too hard and actually hurt the plant or break any roots. Now he is leaning a little bit, uh, so I will kind of keep an eye on that to make sure I don't have to actually use any wires or anything, but if I need to, I will. That's what's great about these mica pots is they're very durable, but uh, you can drill through them to actually feed in some wires to actually hold the plant upright and more straight and more centered. Like I said, if you're looking for a bonsai or just a all around great tree to have and add to your um, yard or just anything like that. These are the great trees to have. They're a part of history. They've been around longer than any other tree. Uh, they are got this will to survive. Uh, they can put up with anything. Take different temperature fluctuations from hot to cold. Uh, pollution doesn't do anything. Pest doesn't do anything to them really. Uh, some do, but not a whole lot. Fungi is not really a problem, uh, so if you want one, uh, they do take probably just a little bit of normal uh, care that you would just give to any other plant, uh, so this is a great tree to have. I hope this video helped you all out and inspires you to maybe go out and buy a ginkgo biloba tree, uh, but be warned, they are considered endangered species, uh, I guess just because of the habitat loss and the demand for them. Uh, so there's not too much in the way of a natural ginkgo biloba, uh, but we got to be more cautious uh, and attentive to that so that we do not end up losing this tree that's been around forever. Uh, so you all... Go ahead and leave me a comment and let me know if you've ever had a uh, ginkgo biloba tree or if you've even grown one as a bonsai. Let me know about your success and failures with the tree. I've had him for a little over a year now. He's put on a lot of mass and he's grown quickly. So be warned, they are a little bit of a fast growing tree, uh, but when they lose, just before they lose their leaves in the fall, they have this beautiful yellow color uh, that is gorgeous. It lets everybody know that fall is actually here. Um, and while you're at it, hit the subscribe button or the bell next to it. That way you'll know anytime I've uploaded a new video. You guys take it easy, have a good one, and don't forget, always plant prudently. Thank you, YouTube. Real quick, I wanted to thank my Patreon subscribers. Pam donated this month. If you're interested in supporting my channel through Patreon, check the link in the description box below.